All right, Alexander, let's do an update. What is going on in Ukraine? We have, uh, we have the peace, the peace uh, tour. Let's call it the peace tour from the Chinese envoy. And with him, he has a roadmap for peace. We're not going to call it a, a peace plan. It's more of a roadmap for secession to hostilities. We have uh, more Russian drones and missiles hitting throughout Ukraine. And um, what else do do we have? We have more Russian advances yes. as well. Yes, yes. In I mean, uh, Avdivka, in Chasovyad, or towards, towards Chasovyad. Yes. And uh, we also have, what else do we have, uh, uh, Alexander, for, for an update to Ukraine? Well, uh, There's something uh, uh, else uh, on my mind, but I just yeah. can't. <laughs> put your finger. I can't well, remember. C- can I? Can I, I just? Yeah. Can I just suggest one thing, which is probably not the same as you have, which is a, a darkening again of the mood in parts of the media in the West. Especially, I've noticed the publications in the West that deal with military affairs. But I mean, we've had that, that was yeah yeah. That no, was, go, go go on. That, I, I mean, was going to say the counteroffensive. So it kind of yes, kind of yes, coincides the yes, the delay just, in the exactly, in the big offensive. Yeah, exactly. Which is, I mean. Which is upsetting uh, the media. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. I mean, the, the, the the, the, I mean, we've had we've had you know articles like you know by, by Daniel Davis, for example, in forty five, but also articles in the Wall Street Journal about the fighting in Bakhmut, articles in the New York Times, a very interesting piece in Business Insider of all places about the fact that the Turkish Bayraktar drones have now been basically <laughs> eliminated from the scene. Uh, they're no longer uh, uh, um, operating. The Russians are able to jam them and shoot them down now without any difficulty. We've had a long, long analysis of the state of the war it, by the Royal United Services Institute, which has been talking at great length. And this is in Britain. That's the British military think tank, which has been talking about the way in which the Russian military has successfully adapted to many th- uh, many of the aspects of the war. And we get an overall sense now that hopes that this offensive, when it is eventually launched, is going to change the strategic picture in any significant way. We get the sense, I get increasingly the sense that hopes for that are now have now faded out. I mean, nobody any longer seriously entertains that belief in the West anymore, except perhaps Victoria Newland and her friends. So I mean, you know, so um, we we've, we've had a darkening of the mood. Russian advances, as you absolutely rightly say, they're not, you know, dramatic. They're not, you know, advancing rapidly. I get the sense that the situation in Avdeyevka, which is this town near Donbass, it's near Donetsk city, is becoming increasingly critical. That the Russians seem to be moving forward step by step, and we are now talking about a real possible encirclement of that of Avdeyevka. They didn't seek us encirclement of Bakhmut, if we remember. They came very close to it, and then they stopped. And I think we've now had explanations as to why they wanted that to stop. They wanted the Ukrainians to continue to send troops into Bakhmut so that they could basically be destroyed there. I, d- I think Avdevka is different. I think the Russians want to just capture this place, move the front lines further west, because it's just too close to Donetsk city. So anyway, problems for the Ukrainians there. Problems for the Ukrainians in the area near Bakhmut. The Russians are gradually pushing towards Chasovya. There's also um, apparently a growing Russian bridgehead across the Oskol River in the north. We get very, very little information about what's going on there. But that could be significant because it might reopen... Um, areas which Ukraine recaptured in the Kharkov offensive of the autumn, it could reopen them to further fighting. And then, of course, the big story over the last couple of days, endless Russian missile and drone strikes. I mean, all the stories you remember, weeks of stories of Russia's running out of cruise missiles, Russia's running out of (laughs) 
um, every kind of missile, apparently, and they keep on coming, and they're coming in floods. And we had a massive combined drone and missile strike on Kiev, and, uh, the, of course, the Ukrainians always claim that they've shot down most of these missiles, but some clearly are getting through, despite what the Ukrainians tell us from time to time. And a really very interesting uh, um, comment by a Ukrainian official, apparently, about the um, these Geranium-2 drones. Um, they've clearly become more sophisticated, because when they were first used by the Russians, they were sort of went on a sort of pre-programmed flight path. Now, apparently, the Russians are able to control their movements by satellite. <laughs> um, they also have some kind of satellite guidance, which presumably is from the Russian satellite arrays. So that's GLONASS, not GPS. But the result is that the these drones don't follow pre-programmed, easily tracked flight paths. They can manoeuvre, they can go in all kinds of directions. They're proving much more difficult for the Ukrainians to shoot down. And it's causing more and more problems for their air defence system. And, of course, the purpose of these cruise missile strikes and these drone strikes is to disrupt Ukraine's logistics, its um, infrastructure, the various preparations it's making for this offensive about which, as I said, Western hopes seem to have faded out. Yeah, so the big story in all of this is, uh, the big picture story is the collective West, they want an offensive. They want it yesterday. It's a political decision. It's obvious that the Alensky regime, they don't want to go through with this offensive Olensky is, is traveling around trying to, to avoid having to be in Ukraine when this offensive is launched and he's begging for more weapons because the Russians continue to, to, to destroy all the weapons. Zeluzhny, we've talked about Zeluzhny in the past video. He's fading away. He doesn't, whether it is Zeluzhny, he doesn't want to have anything to do with, with whatever offensive is taking place. Sirsky's disappeared as well. What? How, how do you? How do we square this? The collective yeah. West wants an offensive. The Alaska regime does not want an offensive. Everyone, though, has agreed that the offensive is not going to deliver the the big picture item, the return of Crimea. Let's say that's that was the big you know, the, the severing of the land bridge, the the taking over of Crimea, whatever they were talking about. Uh, Budanov saying that he's going to be swimming in in Crimea or fishing in Crimea. I mean. Everyone understands it's not going to happen, but they want this offensive. Yes. And Ukraine doesn't want this offensive. Yes. And it's also crystal clear, Alexander, I think we could say definitively that the whole F-16 thing is just a delay tactic. Yes. That's all it is. Yes. They're, they're I just agree with that. thinking of new weapons so they, so they can delay. Yeah. I, I, I completely agree with all of that. But can I just point out how uh, crazy, in my opinion at least, and I mean irrational, uh, and and reckless this whole thing is because I mean everybody apparently now quietly accepts this offensive isn't going to achieve a knockout blow. Milly came out and said, you know, Ukraine isn't going to recapture all its territory. <laughs> I mean, he, the way he spoke, I got the impression he didn't think it would capture much of its territory, not any, you know, all of it. Or but anyway, then that's what that was Milly. So he's skeptical clearly about the offensive, and he's the U.S.'s military's senior military officer. And yet, because the Western public has been promised this offensive, there has to be an offensive. So everybody's talking about this offensive. And we now have interviews of Ukrainian officials um, w I in the Western media. There was a rather painful one, I thought, on the BBC when one of Zelensky's officials, I think it was Podolyak, I can't remember which one, he was being pushed. You know, when, are, when is this offensive going to happen? And he said, well, you know, we've got to prepare for this. It's got to happen. And uh, we've got to, this is our, you know, we, we can't afford to things not to go right. So, you know, it could be in a couple of days. It could be next week. I can't tell you when it is. But why ask, why ask him a question like that? You can see the sort of pressure to get 
Ukraine to launch this offensive. And no real regard for the fact that thousands of people are going to die. Huge losses are going to be um, suffered. And there's a very high probability that Ukraine is going to be left in a weaker position than it was before the offensive took place. Um, so it, it, it always very strange to me. And of course, the Russians are following all of this. They're following all this debate about this offensive and they're preparing for this offensive because they know that this offensive is coming because everybody in the West and in Ukraine is talking about it continuously. I mean, the whole thing is very weird. It's to me, you know, as a non-military person, I can't say how bizarre it is. I mean, it just doesn't make any kind of sense. But anyway, that's where we are. That's the situation we've been trapped into. As you said, it's all playing for time, uh, uh, playing a game of, you know, trying to save face, despite the fact that all the military people in the West are now united in saying this thing isn't going to work. It's the Russian military is not the same military that it was last year. Things are not working out at all well. And um, if we do launch this offensive, it will it will it will fail. But what we're going to do instead, because alongside all the talk of the offensive, we have the diplomatic games. We have Li Hui traveling on his travels from China. We have discussions in the West about what the long term outcome is going to be. So what is the the political calculus that you think they're thinking of uh, of implementing? I mean, because this is obviously not a political, this is not a military strategic decision. This is a political decision. We want the offensive. What are they, what are they hoping for? Because they're not hoping for the win. It, maybe there's a 0 0.0 whatever percent chance that something will happen and they'll sever the land bridge and take Crimea. Okay, fine. But living in the real world, living like in the world of reality, they, 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 they must be angling for something. Are they just trying to buy time as Biden goes through an election cycle? Are the Europeans hoping that by doing the offensive, I'm, I'm just, I, I don't know, is the Biden White House hoping that by doing the yeah. offensive, they please a certain constituency? I yeah. don't know, the neocons, I mean, I'm just trying to figure out what do they gain from a failed offensive? I think, I think, I think that that's the key question. I think what, what they, gain, they gain yeah. from a failed offensive. I think, I think what they gain is this. I think that the collective West has collectively realised, I mean, there may be some holdouts in London, for example, but I think they realised that Ukraine can't win this war. I think this is something that they've fully understood. So the, they have to find some pathway towards a negotiated outcome which doesn't leave the West completely humiliated and enables that the politicians who were behind all of this to tiptoe away and say that we've achieved something. But there are problems. They have to persuade the hardliners in the West that this um, outcome of a decisive Ukrainian victory is beyond our reach. And they also have to persuade the hardliners in Kiev that a hardline victory, that, that an outright victory for Ukraine is also beyond its Ukraine's reach. In other words, people like Budanov. So the way you do that is you set up Ukraine for a battle it's going to lose. And then you start engaging in diplomacy. You say to the Ukrainians, look, you can't win this war. They say to the hardliners in the West, look, Ukraine can't win this war. So we have got to find some way to resolve this conflict now. Because the longer it continues, the more difficult the situation becomes, both for Ukraine and ultimately for us. And I think that we are now starting to see some ideas about what people are thinking about. People like Sullivan, for example, who I think has started to distance himself from some of the neocons, some of the more hardline neocons, people like Blinken and Newland. So their idea is freeze the conflict, um, allow the Russians 
to retain control of what they control. Not the whole of Donbass, notice, but those areas of Donbass that they still control. Freeze the conflict and tell Ukraine that in return for Ukraine agreeing to freeze the conflict, Ukraine can join the EU and NATO. I think that's, that's the scheme that they have at the moment. I mean, there's a lot more talk, if you've noticed recently, about Ukraine joining NATO. There's a big uh, NATO summit meeting coming up in July, uh, uh, which could be, by the way, um, after, could be time for after the um, offensive has visibly failed. So it may be that at that point they lean on Zelensky. They say, look, we've given you everything we can. We've given you tanks, we've given you guns, we've given you shells, we've given you huge amounts of intelligence. We can't sustain this. So you've got to accept that you're going to make territorial concessions. We don't, we're not asking you to officially recognise the loss of Crimea and eastern Ukraine, but what you can do is you can agree to freeze the conflict, join NATO, and then you can bide your time and wait like West Germany did. And eventually, at some point in the remote future, you'll be able to get your territories back. That, 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 that I think, is the game plan at the moment. Now, of course, as you will have realised, Russia, it, it, has, to. Russia <laughs> has to agree, exactly. And that's, that's the fundamental problem. But um, th there was a really good article by Eve Smith in Naked Capitalism um, a little while ago, in which she said the fundamental problem with the way in which uh, uh, Western governments are approaching this, and it's so like the way the EU works, is that they spend all their time negotiating with each other. They don't really think about the people on the other side. And you know, this is something that they can all say to themselves they, you know, this will work for us. We can agree with this. This is, we're freezing the conflict. We can say that we've preserved Ukraine. It's a politically palatable outcome for us. It ends the war. And getting to understand that the Russians might not be happy with this, might in fact reject it outright, which is, by the way, the Russians are signalling that they will reject it outright if a proposal like this is ever made to them. Anyway, that isn't something that they have any mental room for to even consider because all their mental energy is taken up, devoted to negotiating with each other. I wonder if the, if the plan morphs into something like... I, I guess you go back to to one of the the first deals that was put on the table, which which the Russians were not so negative on, um, NATO, no chance. So I, I think you know Ukraine and NATO, whatever form Ukraine takes in in, in the near future, I think that's that's going to be rejected by the Russians outright. But I wonder if the plan could morph into something like, look, um, okay, NATO's off the table. We're not going to push Ukraine to NATO, but. Will you guys at least give us the European Union? You know, whatever, what, whatever shape Ukraine is in in the next three months or six months, whatever, whatever it is, let's freeze it. And we'll take NATO off the table because that's obviously something that the Russians will never agree to. But uh, Mr. Mr. Putin, Mr. Lavrov, how about we, we give Elensky something? We give him the European Union, something he can take back to his people and he can claim a victory there. Give us a victory so Biden can campaign in the United in the United States and say, you know, I, you know, Ukraine, uh, we 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 gave Ukraine the the capabilities, the weapons, the money to stand up to the Russians and siege of Kiev, um, the Kharkov, great great offensive, and all of these things. And and then I negotiated a settlement, and um, Ukraine is entering the European Union. They could easily spin that in a way that that the the American voter will will say, okay, you know, at least it wasn't Afghanistan. Yeah, <laughs> you know, at least it oh, wasn't I, Afghanistan. I, I, and 
and the Ukraine is going to be part of the, the democratic, free, liberal world of, of Ursula von der Crazy and the European Union, and it sounds all nice and good without getting into the, the details. I mean, once again, do, would the Russians agree to something like that? I think not, but maybe the plan is that they can bring it to, to yeah. something like that. Where I think NATO the, is out, but the EU is in. Right. I think the Russians came very close to, as you correctly said, to saying that that would they be did. acceptable yeah. to them, provided there were cast iron guarantees that Ukraine would not join NATO. Now, when they talk about cast iron guarantees, they talk about treaties, treaties not just with Ukraine. They were prepared to negotiate that, negotiate that as I remember, back in uh, Istanbul in March last year, but also treaties with the West. And I think that for the West to turn round and give an absolute categorical commitment that the that Ukraine would never join NATO, I think that would be politically very difficult. But beyond that, the Russians are also going to insist on something else, and this is where we go back to the Istanbul agreements, because, of course, when Putin first ordered the special military operation, he set out for demands. And Russian officials, the Russian ambassador in London has just been talking, they're making very clear that those four demands are non-negotiable. And one of them is demilitarization. <laughs> and um, again, the Russians have made it fairly clear that when they talk about demilitarization, it will be in a format that they decide what that means. So um, it's going to be very difficult, I think, to get the West once more to accept demilitarization on those kind of terms. Because, of course, the Russians will want to make sure that NATO, rather than an Ukraine in the EU... And by the way, it would be a disaster for the EU if Ukraine in its present shape were to join. But I, I mean, well, you know, this is a topic for another day. Uh, um, um, that NATO, Ukraine into the EU isn't a passport for Ukraine joining NATO one day. Uh, uh, the West making all kinds of undertakings, promises, treaties, that kind of thing, which is then... Um, doesn't honour. So, you know, there's, there's, there's all those problems of um, trust now. And I think that the Russians would simply say, look, if it's just that, if you just come along and say, well, you know, we're not going to have Ukraine in NATO, but we want them in the EU, that's not just not going to be acceptable. They will want something a lot more concrete and a lot more elaborate than that. And that is where Li Hui, the Chinese diplomat, comes in. Well, the, the Biden White House is already signaling that they find China's proposals unacceptable. Yeah. Yeah. You know, there's, and you come back to, to the final option, which is the conflict runs, it, runs its course and uh, it, it ends up being a disaster yeah. for the Biden White House. Yes. The question becomes, though, is it the Biden White House? Can the Biden White House then drag this on? at least until after the elections. Yes, yes. For when, when either Biden is re-elected, so it's not an issue for him, or you have a new administration in which the Democrats turn it into an issue for the new yes. administration. Can they extend this conflict out through the, through the entire uh, 2023 campaign cycle? Well, it's, it, right, let, let, let's just... Talk about all of that. Let's talk about, first of all, what Li Hui is said to be proposing. Now, I say said to be proposing because we've not had any official confirmation from anybody, but we've, we're hearing rumours that are circulating, apparently, um, about his proposals. First of all, he's saying that Ukraine must concede sovereignty to Russia of the four regions, uh, plus Crimea. So, Zaporozhye, Kherson, uh, uh, Donetsk, uh, Don, Donetsk, Lugansk, as well as Crimea, recognise that these are now part of Russia. That's going to be very difficult for Ukraine to do, but that's apparently what Li Hui is telling the West. That's the minimum. He's also talking about 
a big demilitarised zone, which will include places like Kharkov as well. That's the rumour. Now, I think there's more to it than this, because I'm pretty sure, by the way, that Li Hui and the Chinese will have coordinated this with the Russians, because the Chinese have, spe have repeatedly spoken about any peace deal must be based on the principle of equal security for all countries. In other words, no country must be put in a position where it feels threatened by any other country. Now, this is a point which the Russians have been hammering away on ever since they first proposed those, those draft treaties back in 2021, uh, just before the war, the fighting began. So, <laughs> that brings us all the way back to the NATO issue, because what Li Hui is essentially saying is that we don't just want Ukraine out of NATO. That's obvious. We want a complete change to the format of the security architecture in Europe. Which is what the Russians were talking about back in December 2021. Now, that is that was then and remains still unacceptable to the United States. I, I think that is something that no US administration that one can imagine at the moment could agree to. So that brings us back to the second part of your question. Can the Biden ha White House spin this thing out until after the 2024 election? Perhaps they can, but always remember that from the point of view of the United States, there is the Biden White House, the president himself and his election team. And then there are the people who have effective power in the United States. They're not the same that <laughs> they might consider. Ultimately, look, if we have to play this out in a way that basically kills Joe's re-election prospects, that's a prospect which we can live with. What we can't live with is an agreement with the Chinese and the Russians, especially the Chinese, even more than the Russians, which changes the security architecture in Europe. So better have Ukraine go down to glorious defeat, entire, complete defeat, than have the entire question of Europe's security architecture opened. And yes, maybe, just possibly, we can spin it out beyond the election in 2024, because let's face it, we'd rather have Joe as president than perhaps someone else who might be more independent minded, especially if that person is Donald Trump. But at the end of the day, if we have to sacrifice him, if we have to sacrifice Joe, because it's not practical to keep this thing going beyond 2024. Well, I think that there are people in Washington who are absolutely prepared to make that choice. For them, keeping the security system in Europe based on NATO and NATO anchored in the United States, in Washington, it's too important for them to sacrifice if they have to say goodbye, kiss goodbye, to Joe Biden, well, so be it. Yeah, I mean, NATO is where all the money is at. But, uh, you know, there, there's the one thing that the Biden White House could do, which I think would be the, the best course of action for the Biden White House, not for all these other groups, but for the Biden White House, it would be to just drop U Ukraine now. Yeah. Now, though. Yeah. Now, I'm before the election gets started, we talked about this in a previous video, before the election gets started, before the campaigning starts, drop it now. Eat the criticism that you're going to get. Just for one week, you're going to get criticism. Fine. Just like Afghanistan, you can do a couple of softball interviews with Stephanopoulos of ABC News. And uh, in a week's time, everyone will forget about it. And then you can uh, move on. But drop it now. Yes, the Europeans will be furious. Yes, the Europeans will feel betrayed. Yes, Ukraine will, will have to negotiate with Russia. Within 24 hours, they're going to have to sit at a table with Russia. All of these things are going to happen, but NATO is still, is still there. The Europeans, as upset as they will be, 
They can't go anywhere now. No one wants to deal with Europe. No one likes the European leadership. The EU is stuck with the United States. Germany's been deindustrialized. It's stuck with the United States. Nord Stream is gone. Uh, the energy from Russia is gone. So even the EU, they may throw a fit and they may complain for a week or two. But at the end of the day, they're going to come back to the U.S. because they have no other friends in the world. So if he drops it now, like just now he says, OK, we're out then the Biden White House can get past this Ukraine debacle. But he has to do it quick. I completely agree. And I think that may very well be how it turns out, because that is actually from a, if you're looking at this from Joe Biden's, um, you know, interests, he's a re-election interests. That is probably the best outcome. I mean, trying to keep this going all the way up to 2024 and beyond is going to be extremely difficult. And um, the, the risk is if you do that, if you continue to commit to supporting Ukraine throughout 2020, what's left of 2023 and into 2024, then you're going to find yourself in a situation where um, you are gradually drawn into a negotiating process as the situation in Ukraine continues to go against you, a little bit like the Paris negotiations that happened in the late 60s and early 1970s over Vietnam, a negotiating process which is not going to work well for you. I mean, it, it might actually worsen your political position. Whereas, you know, you have the offensive, the offensive fails, you hope it fails, actually, because from this point of view, this is the best outcome. You hope it fails, or perhaps if it succeeds, if it gets a bit, bit of territory here, you say to Ukraine, well, We've done all we can. We've given you tanks. We've given you F-16s. We've given you um, uh, infra uh, Bradleys and M777 howitzers. We've given you lots of training. We've done everything you can reasonably ask of us. We simply cannot do more. If you're not prepared to sit down and negotiate with the Russians, then we wash our hands of you and walk away. And at that point, perhaps the Ukrainians will be left with no choice. They'll do their own deals with the Russians. That's no longer a concern of the United States, or if they don't, and Ukraine collapses. And remember, we've had people like Josip Borrell, Avril Haines, the Director of National Intelligence, uh, um, um, uh, Boris Pristorius, the German defence minister, they all say that, you know, if Western aid is cut off to Ukraine, it will collapse within days. So you could tell that you could tell the Ukrainians all that. You could say, look, go, you know, fine. You won't you won't negotiate. You won't compromise. You, you behave in the same way the President Thieu did in South Vietnam back in 1974 and 1975 and the way President Ghani did in Afghanistan. Well, We'll wash our hands. We've done what we can. You're not listening to our wise advice. We'll walk away and we'll, you know, we'll tell the American people we did what we could. We helped Ukraine. We supported the Russians. And in the meantime, once Ukraine goes down in that way, well, look at the gains you've pocketed. And as you absolutely rightly said, they are not insubstantial. The connections between Russia and Ukraine and, and the EU have been broken probably for decades. Nord Stream is finished. It's kaput. That problem has gone. We got commitments from uh, uh, the Europeans to increase defence spending. We have a revitalised, re-energised NATO. So the Europeans might not be happy, but ultimately, from the US, one can't say that there aren't net gains from this affair. All right. Uh, the Duran.locals.com. We are on Rumble, Odyssey, Bitch Shoot, and Telegram. And go to the Duran shop. Pick up a t shirt, 10% off. Use the code. Good day. Take care.